weekend. No matter who you are or how you self-identify or where or with whom you are today, we're glad you're connecting with us. I invite you now to join us for a gathering call. Our worship guide should have been uploaded a few minutes ago. It was in the email from yesterday as well. Hear now our gathering call. I will restore your health and I will heal your wounds, declares the Lord, because you are labeled an outcast. Let my whole being bless the Lord. Let everything inside me bless his holy name. Que todo mi ser bendiga al Señor. Que todo dentro de mi bendiga su santo nombre. Let my whole being bless the Lord and never forget all his good deeds. How God forgives all your sins, heals all your sickness. Como Dios perdona todos tus pecados, sana todo tu enfermedad. How God saves your life from the pit, crowns you with faithful love and compassion. Como Dios salva tu vida de la fosa, te corona con amor y compasión y fieles. How God satisfies you with plenty of good things, so that your youth is made fresh like an eagle's. Como Dios te satisface. Con, con un montón de cosas buenas, pero que tu juventud se, se haga fresca como la de un águila. The Lord works righteousness, does justice for all who are oppressed. El Señor obra con rectitud, hace justicia por todos los que son oprendidos. You know about Jesus of Nazareth, whom God anointed with the Holy Spirit and endowed with power. Jesus traveled around doing good and healing everyone oppressed by the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. And all, all that, that God, God does through Christ, Christ even, even today. today. May God bless this reading and the hearing of the Holy Scriptures as we continue to sing and worship together. watching us on Facebook Live. Uh, the recording is uploaded to our website, newlifemcc.net. 
You can also, this morning, if you're connecting with us on Facebook Live, you can start a watch party by clicking that little uh, watch party tab on your Facebook screen uh, and invite all your friends, neighbors, and family to join us as well. And, of course, you can always make comments or prayer requests uh, and connect with each other during the service. Well, a few weeks ago, or a few months ago now, was one of our church members uh, quit. I noticed she had written on there. I won't throw Bonnie under the bus. But anyway, she said, it's so great to know we talk as much online as we do during service when we're there in person. <laughs> Just as reminders, this is a lot of things going on this week. Uh, on Tuesday evening, our grief and support group will meet on Zoom. If you have not been part of that group and you need to reach out and want to be part of that group, please reach out to Calvin or Jeannie. That contact information is in the email version of what's happening. Uh, on Tuesday evening as well is our, our, our say August. This is September. September board meeting. Uh, it's an open meeting. If you'd like that Zoom link, reach out to me or any of our board members and we'll be happy to send that to you. Wednesday evenings, we continue with Wednesday evening on Zoom at 7 o'clock. Again, we can get that Zoom link to you if you haven't been doing that. On Thursday, it's an all-hands-on-deck for everybody who signed up to be part of and has been already part of our capital campaign uh, team planning and efforts. As we get this fall, we're going to launch that. Yes, believe it or not, what we hoped to have done a year ago Several things delayed us, COVID delayed us, but in the midst of a pandemic, we're placing faith and trust that we're going to be able to do this. God didn't bring us this far to turn back now. Amen? I've heard that a number of times from folks. I know that sounds cliche, but boy, it sure helps to say it. Thursday evening, I was mentioning, is a 7.30 meeting for all team leaders and team members with Tom Melzoni, who's working with us, our, our financial consultant, uh, getting ready for this campaign. And all team leaders, be ready. Tom wants to hear from you what your plans are, and we'll share it together at that time, 7.30 on Thursday, September the 10th. Later this month, a couple of things I announced last week. We have uh, a couple of discovery and conversation groups that we're going to be launching. The dates and times for those uh, we'll be announcing in a week or so. The first one is Together 10 Building Blocks for a Successful Relationship. And that's using Reverend Elder Ken Martin's new book by that title. Uh, Ken hopefully will be able to join us. He's offered to join us for the first session, so we're waiting to hear back from Ken uh, for, before we schedule that. But that's scheduled for late September, early October, and we'll work Ken in when he's able to work with us on that as well. You can get the book at reverendkenmartin.com. That link is in what's happening as well. The second one is also an exciting discovery and conversation opportunity, I think, Witnessing Whiteness, the Need to Talk About Race and How to Do It. Uh, it's a book by Shelley Tukluk, uh, uh, and I may be pronouncing that wrong. It's available on Amazon, and a number of folks within our community, Phyllis and many and others, myself, will be helping to facilitate that conversation, but certainly in this time, when a lot of racial tensions and a lot of folks ignoring the need to talk about it. I'll say no more about that, although I'll say some more later. Um, <laughs> encourage you to look at both of those books uh, and to use this as an opportunity for us to not only connect, but to not just hear each other, but to listen to each other. And I think that is so very important. Also, at the end of the month, you'll notice that uh, we have our next regular Meals to Go uh, prep day, and that is Saturday, September the 19th at 10 a.m. Talk to Matt or Morocco if you have questions about that. Again, thank you for the many ways that you continue to connect and support, and not just support, but be part of who we are at what we call New Life Metropolitan Community Church of Hampton Roads. It doesn't make any difference if you're here in Hampton Roads or all the way across the world, or you're in Ohio or California, wherever you are. We're delighted to have you connect with us and to have you consider yourself part of us as well. You can always go on our website and find information. You can leave prayer requests there. Get an opportunity during the service today to do that as well. You can go to our website, click on the prayer tab, and leave a prayer request. You can email me. If you're looking to give, you can connect on our, giving pay on our website on the giving tab by clicking the giving tab. It will drop down, click on it again. It will take you to our online giving platform. And thank you for so many folks who continue to put stuff in the mail or drop it in the church mailbox here uh, on site. Thank you for your generosity and giving yourselves and making it possible for us to continue being who God has called us to be. Let's take just a moment and breathe. 
Just a moment and say, thank you, God. Just a moment and claim God's presence and God's promises for ourselves and for so many others across the world. As we have been doing through the month of August and will continue through the month of September, you notice the five candles, the green candles that are on the communion table to sort of guide our prayer thoughts for this day. And I encourage you throughout the week to find maybe five things that you would like to focus on in your prayers this week. And as you share those prayer concerns or praises with us, our prayer and intercessory group, we affectionately call it the pig team, prayer and intercessory group, uh, continues to remember those. So it's not just lost to the internet and lost to uh, cyberspace, but it is certainly part of our heart and soul throughout the week as well. The first candle, and James, I'm going to ask you as we go through these five to light each candle, not right now, but just one at a time. The first one is about everything that's related to COVID. Those that we have lost, those who are sick, those who are at risk. In some ways, that's all of us, but there are folks within our community and the greater communities that we live and work that are more at risk than others. Remembering the separation that we feel and isolation and loneliness that we feel from family and from friends. From the stresses that we feel related to our jobs and finances and all others. And to pray for a vaccine and for those who God has given wisdom in science to be able to heal us physically in those ways. Scott, would you lead our prayer for all things COVID? Dear God, we come before you today, first of all, giving thanks. But we ask for a blessing on this nation and this world as we've struggled with other pandemics and epidemics. Uh, and we made mistakes along the way, certainly at the leadership level. God, we ask for a special uh, blessing of discernment, compassion, for those who are infected or at risk for COVID, and actually that's all of us, that our world leaders uh, do not deny uh, what's in front of us. As we reflect back over uh, some of the mistakes that we made in the early days of HIV and AIDS and uh, our political um, leadership, um, God, we ask that you just move on hearts because that's where, where you work. Dear God, we pray a blessing on the families and all those who've been infected or affected by COVID, and we ask that you give us uh, a way forward to healing in this nation, not only with the disease, but all the hurt that's come from it, in Christ's name. Our second candle of prayer for today is around tensions around racial injustice. For lives that have been lost, lives that have been taken, violence that has been suffered, injustices that have been suffered. Remind us that in Scripture, even Jesus was challenged about the prejudices and bias of his day by the Syrophoenician woman who wanted healing for her daughter. And she kept pushing back and pushing back. Jesus wasn't even supposed to be talking to her because not only was she a woman, but she was of a different race and culture. And yet, I can just almost see the smile, the twinkle in Jesus' eye when he realized, yes, I can be challenged too. If Jesus allowed himself to be challenged, who are we to say that we shouldn't be challenged around that? I remind us that diversity is a gift from God. And I usually end that by saying that inclusivity requires an individual choice, which it does by each of us. But I want to add something in the middle. Diversity is a divine gift from God. But welcoming, acceptance, and tolerance is not enough. It's inclusivity that requires a partnership with God and requires an individual choice and action by all of us. James, would you lead our prayer around racial injustice today? God, you know our hearts. You know where they are. You know where those that would want harm to come to people of color or anybody who is different, God, I just ask that you would grab those hearts, God, that you would 
heal those of us that need it, God. We just ask that you keep us all safe. Keep us all safe. Help us remember, God, that when you when we look at each other, we're seeing you. We see the face of God as we love God. And God I just ask that you be with everyone involved in this issue. God, that you keep keep yourself in front of all of that, God. Because you are the center and you should be the focus of all of this, God. You made all of us in a unique way. All of us are special in our own way. When you take away our outer shell, we all have the same inner. And God, I just ask that you continue to watch over all of this, God, and that you get to keep us all safe and keep us remembering who you are and why you came to save us. Amen. And on this Labor Day weekend for our third candle of prayer, even though we think of Labor Day being the unofficial end of summer, last Sunday I wore a cream or a white jacket. I've got a little striped one in here today, but tomorrow I guess I'm going to have to put all those away because you're not supposed to wear, wear white after Easter. I mean, whoop, after Labor Day. Who, whoever came up with that fashion statement, I don't know. But right. as we begin our prayer around things related to not only opportunities for us to work and have careers and make a living, but also some injustices around that, I want you to take a moment to reflect on when you were younger, perhaps some of you that young now, when you got your first job, when you got your first real job, your first paycheck, your dream job, your career. Somebody you know, said, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Some folks have the privilege of being able to do that. Others do not. Others work tirelessly exhausting hours just to make ends meet. And sometimes it's still not enough, especially during the pandemic. We've been reminded that jobs can be lost and that jobs can be furloughed. And there's so much stress around that. We also are reminded that even though we live in supposedly a free society, there are tens of millions of people around the world that are still in slavery. Slavery, maybe in a sense that it is debt bondage in the sense they're trying to work off something that they may not ever be able to work off in forced labor, in forced marriages and relationships across the world. In our prayers today, let us not forget them. And whether in our history across the world, from slaves to serfs to indentured service to forced labor, and remember that much of this country was built on the backs of slaves, and certainly on the backs of immigrants from all across the world. It is so important for us to remember that. It is important for us to remember that in the injustices that not only in the LGBTQ plus community, but especially in for people of color within our community, there are inequities. A couple of sources have given us these statistics that 40% of LGBTQ plus folks are in high risk jobs related to COVID. Some 2 million or 15% of our community are restaurant and food service workers. A million or more, 7.5 work in hospitals. We celebrate that this past June, the Supreme Court in June of 2020 finally realized that LGBTQ plus folks are protected under civil rights laws. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. And yet we are in a political environment that tries to dismantle all of that. 20% of LGBTQ plus folks experience some discrimination based on sexual orientation in the workplace. But get this, people of color within our community were 32% more likely to experience that people of color in women than whites. 22% of folks within the LGBTQ community suffer and experience pay inequities. And there are many more other different and other aspects of discrimination, especially for those of our transgender community as well. Isaac, would you lead our prayer today around the opportunities, but also lifting up the injustices that we pray for God's wisdom and love to take root in our lives and in our leaders. Yes, Lord. 
Dear God, as we are approaching Labor Day this weekend, let's reflect and count our blessings for uh, those who are working and those who are capable of working. Um, and ask for blessing and protection for those affected by the pandemic, those who have been um, fired or unemployed or furloughed from their job, those who are unable to find employment at this current time, and those who are those who are incapable of doing so, just ask for blessings of protection on them, especially for those in high, uh, those who are working and are in high risk areas. Please protect them, Father, as uh, we're still going through all this. Um, and then uh, let's reflect on the world at large and ask for protection and blessings on, uh, ask for protection and freedom, actually, from those who are st stuck in uh, slave labor, uh, uh, labor, slave labor, um, those who are stuck in uh, human traffic and sex trafficking, um, and anyone who's working, whose work environment puts them at a disadvantage or disenfranchises them, please protect them and give them freedom, Father. Uh, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. And healing comes in many ways. Sometimes it's physical, sometimes it's emotional, sometimes it's spiritual. And I'll even add intellectually to that. Right. As wherever you are in your needs right now, and you can, again, type in a prayer request uh, on the comment section of Facebook Live or go to our website and write that or reach out to me in a private message or an email or to any member of our prayer and intercessory group. Sarah, would you lead the prayer for healing physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually in our hearts, minds, and bodies? Father God, we come to you because you are the healer, and please heal our land, Father God. This year started out like a science, sci-fi movie almost, and then we're, even though you are with us, we sometimes don't understand the reason, but I'm sure you already know why, why we have to go through this. So Father, we just ask, heal each one of us. Physically, who's suffering from the disease or COVID related. Heal us emotionally that you are our father. You are our mother. You are our sister and brother, father. And also spiritually, just heal us and just, uh, just be more close to you, reach out to you, have a daily conversation with you, father, that we are your children, you give us good things, Father. And maybe after all this is over, we'll know maybe some reason why, some may not know why. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really matter, Father, because you are in control. You are still sit on the throne. Bless us, give us mercy, give us a healing, Father God. We just praise you that you are the healer you will heal our land, Father. And also, as a Christian brother and sister, give us a discernment that who might need healing, physically, maybe financially, or spiritually. Just give us room and intelligence to reach out to them. Just a kind word, or maybe um, sometimes financial assistance, Father. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. We believe you will heal this land. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we can't end our prayers without responding to God's love and God's presence, even in such times, and even in the midst of all that we're challenged with today. There are things for which to be thankful. And it makes no difference how you relate to God, whether it's father, mother, Friend, Jesus said, I call you friends. Yes, yes. However you relate to God today, I invite you to just write a word of praise or thanksgiving. Think of something that you're thankful for as we end our prayer time or we continue our prayer time. Because prayer is just relationship as well. Right, right. Charlie, will you lead us in, in words, right? If we put words to our prayer of thanksgiving and praise. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we bless you right now because we recognize you as the only and true living God. 
Father, we thank you because you are gracious to us. We thank you because we realize and recognize that praise is also a weapon for us in our spiritual journey. God, you said to go into battle and war with two edged sword and the high praises of God in our mouth. And God, is even as we recognize that we read earlier from Psalms 103, it says, With my whole being I will bless the Lord. Let everything inside of me bless your holy name. And God, that's what we're doing this morning. We're blessing you. We're thanking you because you're faithful to us. We're giving you the glory because you love us. We're giving you the honor because you give us attention. God, you made us. You know us. You know everything. You know those things that are deep in our hearts and our minds that we don't even want to talk about to nobody else. You know those things, God. And we thank you because what concerns us concerns you. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 returned and right. from generation to generation to generation somehow perhaps some of the people of Israel had even forgotten the name of Joseph I don't think they probably were allowed to do that much by the elders of the community because they told those stories over and over again about how that the people of Israel had come down to Egypt to find food and even though Joseph had risen from prison to being second only to Pharaoh that eventually the people of Israel became so plen so plentiful, so populous, that they were feared by the Egyptians and pharaohs that didn't know Joseph enslaved the people. And God heard their cries. Here we are picking up today in Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole Israelite community, on the tenth day of this month, they must take a lamb for each household, a lamb per house. If a household is too small for a lamb, it should share one with the name of the neighbor nearby. You should divide the lamb in proportion to the number of people who will be eating it. Your lamb shall be flawless, you're a flawless year old male. You may take it from sheep or from the goats. You should keep close watch over it until the fourteenth day of this month. At twilight on that day, the whole assembly, assembled Israelite community should slaughter their lambs, and they should take the blood, some of the blood and smear it on two doorposts and on the beam over the door of the houses in which they're eating. That same night, they should eat the meat roasted over the fire. They should eat it along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with its head, legs, and internal organs. Don't let any of it remain until morning and burn any of it left over in the morning. This is how you should eat it. You should be dressed with your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. 
You should eat the meal in a hurry. It's the Passover of the Lord. This is the beginning of what even today our Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate as the Passover. God's faithfulness from delivering them out of oppression and slavery. Let us never forget that in our heritage too. It goes on to say, I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night and I'll strike down every oldest child in the land of Egypt. Ironic too, isn't it, that this is happening when generations before it was a Pharaoh that had slaughtered the children that actually ended up with Moses being put in the bulrushes and found by Pharaoh's daughter. He, had, he was a prince of Egypt. And yet he ran because he knew there was injustices being uh, against his brothers and sisters of the Hebrew nation. And he ran after he had slaughtered the guard that was doing that. Here we see God is turning this back around in a way that is going to result in the people of Israel being released from Egypt. Whenever I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day will be a day of remembering for you. You will observe it as a festival to the Lord. You will observe it in every generation as a regulation for all time. That's sometimes hard to believe it can be that long. But if you think about all that's happened in those generations, and yet it's still observed today. Our gospel lesson today, and you can get up out of bed or rise as you're able for the gospel lesson today. It says, if your brother or sister sins against you go and point out their fault just between the two of you if they listen to you you've won them over but if they will not listen take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses if they still refuse to listen to you tell it to the church we will come back and talk about this in a minute because this can be abused and you've seen abuse and i have too if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, it's important to realize here that's probably a better translation would be non-believer or Gentile, because tax collectors of their day were, and not all of them, but some of them had a reputation for being crooked. Right. And I know some of my pagan brothers and sisters who are probably more just and loving than a lot of tax collectors. Yeah. Now here, amen to that. <laughs> tell you, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, I am in their midst. May God bless this reading and the hearing of the Holy Scriptures today. <laughs>
Gracious and merciful God, in this moment, as we open our hearts again to you and simply give thanks and praise for all that you are and all that you make it possible for us to be as well. As we take a moment to give thanks and as we offer ourselves, as the scripture reminds us, as a living sacrifice, which is part of our worship and part of our service, together hand in glove. That as we worship you and serve you, as we serve you and worship you, we're offering ourselves as you have offered love and forgiveness and life and life more to the full in wholeness of love and life. We come humbly to you, thanking you, praising you, and all God's people said, Amen. I invite you to give as God's Spirit leads you to give. It's a small token of what we've been blessed with in our lives, and thank you again. For your generosity of spirit and soul and literally as you give to financially continue the ministries that we're called to be about even in these challenging times again you can go to our website newlifemcc.net click on the giving tab it'll drop down click again it'll take you to our online giving platform you can drop something in the mail or drop it by personally on the porch of the church thank you again for who you are and for being part of new life metropolitan community church may god bless you today let there be love shared among us. Let there be love in our lives. Bring out your love, sweet this nation. Cause us, O oh Lord, to arise. Give us a fresh understanding. As our musicians and choir come down, I want to thank them for their generous and faithful commitment and service over these five months. Oh my goodness, we couldn't be doing worship as we're doing it uh, if it weren't for you. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Scott. Thank you and, and other members of our worship team uh, and behind the scenes as well. Right, amen. So I want you to think for just a moment. We're beginning today and over the next four or five weeks to talk about a healing that leads to deliverance and wholeness. Right. You remember back to our interfaith celebration earlier this year, 
our theme was we grieve, we embrace, we heal. And the question that begs to be asked and to be reflected and perhaps even acted on is what does it take for us to heal? All right. Now I want to take you back for a moment for those of you who are connected with us today. Some of you have been to MCC churches and some of you perhaps have not. But for those of you who have been in an MCC church, I want to take you back and ask you to remember what you felt like the first time you walked into an MCC church. I know I cried through the whole service because I realized that no one cared whether I was gay or not. It was okay to be who I am and who I feel called to walk and live into. Think about, for those of you and some of you who are connecting with us or have been part of New Life MCC here in Hampton Roads perhaps for longer than, than I have. In fact, I know that Reverend Roy Richard had connected with us. He's our founding pastor from 1977. Roy, thank you for connecting with us, and we look forward to hearing more from you perhaps in the days ahead as well. Well, what was the first time, what was your first experience coming to New Life? What was that like? I often hear folks say, oh my goodness, I don't know what I expected right. from a bunch of LGBTQ right. people, right. but you all are welcoming and accepting and hugging, Absolutely. and not something that I solicited from that person to ask for. I'm very impressed, so thank you for those of you who've been part of New Life who have helped to build that relationship and climate that we can be accepting and welcoming and hugging. I, I long for the day when we can hug again, but we're going to have to hug virtually right now. Reach out wherever you are and give somebody a virtual hug. I think that's a good thing to do. Now, let's imagine somebody walking into not MCC and not New Life MCC and not even any church. But let's imagine somebody walking into church who's never been to church at all, never heard of Christianity, never even heard of Jesus. What would that person think? What would be going through that person's mind? Well, I, in, my, in my thoughts as I began to think about that, if a person came into church who'd never heard of any of that, never heard of Jesus, if that person, I underscore, if that person made it through the hymns and the songs and the back and forth that we sort of do, and in some high churches, the ups and the downs and all that sort of stuff, made it through the offering and wondering what in the world are they doing with that offering? Are they fleecing us? Are they taking us for a ride? I love the story about the little boy who said, Mama, if, if we give him enough money, will he hush? Will he let us go home early? Some of you, I think, are too far away from that. But imagine if, if that person made it all the way to communion. And that person walked in and began to hear us talk about eating the body and blood of Christ. Oh my goodness, can you imagine how that must, have, must feel to somebody? I, I'm reminded, and I'm telling my age, some of you are old enough to remember the old TV show Gilligan's Island. And remember when Gilligan, anytime there was going to be danger or anytime there were going to be cannibals around, how fast Gilligan would run. I think if I were that person going into the church for the first time, I'd never heard of Jesus or Christianity, didn't understand anything, I'd be running like Gilligan out the front door. Through the centuries, the centuries and generations in Christianity and in the church, Christians have debated, ad nauseum have we debated, the meaning around this table right. of communion. Right this Holy Eucharist, this table of grace, this table of thanksgiving, whatever we call it, Holy Communion, whether we call it the Lord's Table or the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. There's those high society, as my grandparents used to say, high society sounding words, those theological cemetery words, like consubstantiation and transubstantiation. What in the world does that mean? Well, basically, in, in Christianity, we've debated whether or not what happens at that community, communion table with the body and blood, the bread and the cup and the wine. Some, some folks, some Baptists in particular, argue whether it's real wine or not. Right. What difference does it make right. in that sense of it? Does it become the real body in Christ in that moment, or is it symbolic, or how is it present in our lives? And in, in, I like to say, in MCC, and not a lot of folks echo me on this, I like to say we're neither Catholic nor Protestant around this communion table because in the priesthood of the believers, meaning that the Spirit works in you the same as in me, 
we give people the freedom to believe whatever they need to believe and where they are theologically around this community table. I don't get to or tell you what you have to believe as we celebrate Holy Communion. In MCC, a lay person can celebrate just as much as an ordained person. I like that piece of it. Again, back to the priesthood of the believer that I may be called to serve in the role of a pastor, but the Holy Spirit works in you the same as in me. One thing I cannot do as an MCC pastor, and I relish this, there's one thing I can't do. I cannot refuse somebody who wants to come to this table of grace. And neither should any of us. Neither should any of us. But yet the church through the generation, and I use the church loosely, has held that over the heads of kings and queens and leaders and people in the pews and regular and average folks. And yet how many times do we come to this table of grace thinking we're all sacrosanct, and yet something funny happens on the way to the communion. Right. I remember over one of my Baptist churches when I used to be a Baptist pastor over on Lake Gaston, we had a group of senior adult ladies who used to love to make the communion bread. And so they'd come in when we'd serve communion. Didn't do it every Sunday like we do. And by the way, we do communion every Sunday, not because we're trying to mimic high church or Catholic or Episcopal practices, but because when Reverend Elder Troy Perry, our founder and moderator, came, he didn't want anybody coming to an MCC service without the opportunity to be offered to participate in communion. Because Troy knew that so many folks in our community have been told you're not worthy. And you are a child of God. Let no one tell you that, and no one can keep you from that. But over there, we did it maybe once a quarter. I don't remember in the Baptist church. And I often ask them to bake a little loaf, because I'm a visual person, and I like to break it and like to be held in my hands. And one Sunday, I got up, and I uncovered that little loaf. And evidently, James should have had a cow about this. There must have been a little church mouse, or a big church mouse, because a big hunk of that bread was eaten out. Now, I never served that piece. I only broke it. But I very quickly said, let us pray, and flipped it over, and we continued with the service. <laughs> I've seen, and when you do it in, in some churches, even... You know, doing communion in a COVID world is totally different for us today because we can't share it either by a common cup or by intention. It is so different. In Baptist and other traditions, we have what's called curb service where you take the little trays around to individual vices. I've seen those trays go flying through the air and grape juice going all over the carpets and women's dresses. Oh, my goodness. You look back and laugh even though it was a horrible moment in some people's eyes at the time. We even call the, the bread, in some ways, the host. As you go back to it, it's become the, the host of the body of Christ. And some people are going to think I'm, I'm being irreverent and being so irreligious here to say I refer to the big host as big Jesus and what gets served to you as the little Jesus. And what you all can't see on Sunday morning is that I, as I'm serving the, mus the musicians uh, and trying to be as... Uh, careful with regard to the COVID virus and everything, and using tongs to do that, which seems impersonal. I'm chasing little Jesus around that. Little Jesus is the only God, but in tongs sometimes. However you believe around this table of grace, God's Spirit is with you. God is fully present with you. Whether you take the host or whether you take the cup. And some folks say, well, you're only giving the musicians and the choir half of Jesus because you're only giving them, I believe, however you're participating, whether it's with the host or whether it's with the cup or both. God's presence, God's spirit is in you as we come to this table of grace every Sunday and remind you that you're always welcome to do that at home. Years ago, I had a youth group on top of a mountain and they said, let's serve, let's have communion together. Who was I to tell those kids we weren't going to have communion? Right. But you know the only thing we had? We had orange crush and peanut butter crackers. I think that's one of the best communions I think I've ever had. So go get you an orange crush, a big orange, and a peanut butter cracker, whatever you've got at home to celebrate communion with us. And know in your heart that you can't order half a Jesus or a half a rack of Jesus like you can order a half a chicken or a half a lack of rack of ribs. Ribs. I can't talk to that. I need to get something else. Now I say all this because I want to say this. <laughs> Changed it on you today, didn't it? The passage of scripture that we read from Exodus is the beginning of the Passover. 
and what became the Seder meal that our Jewish brothers and sisters hold still so sacrosanct today. As a reminder, as I've said many times, of God's faithfulness to deliver folks from oppression. Right. That's a message, my friend, that will preach not only by me, right. but by you, yes. wherever you are, however you self-identify with whomever, and however you're connecting with folks. We're told in this passage, and I started not to read it all, but there was something about reading it all because you see all the intricate detail of what God instructed them right. to do on that fateful night when they were about to be delivered, and those sort of got folded into the purity and the cleanliness and all the kosher kind of things. But there were some practical reasons there that were probably first and foremost. First, they were told to use unleavened bread. Now, remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the difference between leaven and unleavened bread and what happens when bread rises. In this case, God said, don't wait for your bread to rise. You need to be ready to go. And I want you to get ready. Put your, put your clothes on. Put your shoes on. Don't go naked out the door. Some of you, I may be preaching to some of you all on that. There was a practical element of that. In fact, when you think about the lamb that they were told to prepare. We think about the Passover lamb in Christianity. Jesus, in a sense, became the Paschal lamb. In substitutionary theology, you think about the Jesus took the place of those uh, sacrifices right. in some ways. Yes. And I'll read something in a moment that talks about, and, and remember, we're beginning a series this fall that talks right. about not just being delivered, right. but healing from into a right. deliverance and a wholeness of life. Right. Lots of times, I think, my friends, we, we're okay to be delivered. We want to be saved from something. Right. Right. But we refuse to walk into wholeness. Right. I want you to hold that not only in one hand, but both hands, and both feet, and all that's in between, right. talking about wholeness right. as we go through this year. Right. Listen to what um, one theologian wrote from a progressive standpoint, and he's quoting another, another theologian. Don't you just love it how his preacher types steal and all that? I rarely drop the name. If you want to know the references, I'll tell you later on some of that, but I'm not... Well, Granny used to say you could tell something three times and claim it's yours, but I don't think that's exactly what she meant. She said, say something three times and it's yours. I think she meant you... You've got it. You've got the meaning of it. Don't steal and plagiarize other folks. <laughs> One theologian wrote this. The institution of communion of the Eucharist is an inversion of the temple sacrifices. Pretty much everything that Jesus does during the Last Supper turns all that on its head. Mm -hmm. The usual direction of sacrificial offering is reversed. Instead of the worshiper giving to the God, the God is giving to the worshiper. Jesus gives his body, blood, symbolized by the body and wine. To them, instead of giving their bodies and blood, symbolized by money, to the temple, just as money symbolizes life given to the temple, so bread and wine symbolize the divine life given to the worshiper. He goes on to say that the upper room where the Last Supper was sub substitutes for the temple, the table for the altar, the sharing of food for the killing of the victim, Normally, the worshiper brings the offering into sacred space. Here, the upper room is the non-sacred counterpart. Mm -hmm. What it says to me is right. this holy of holies right. that was part of the temple right. is where you are. Mm -hmm. God's spirit not only just resides there, but resides in you. Can I hear an amen to amen. 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 Hallelujah. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Jesus. But I want to focus on one thing out of this Exodus passage. I'm very conscious of the time on this Labor Day. <laughs> they were told to prepare a lamb, one for each household. But they were also told, if your household is not big enough, share with somebody else. Now, that was almost in reverse, too, because if you don't have enough, go get somebody else. Here, let me come get everybody. Reminds me of somebody taking, reaching, getting something off somebody else's plate. Right. Amen. you got some relatives like that, don't right. you, James? I bet, because you're smiling when you know what I said. That. All of us do. In this case, God is giving them permission to do that. In fact, God's saying it's about sharing. We talk about generosity and giving a lot, but I want us to think about generosity sort of marrying or putting together both sharing and giving. There's a lot of debate over which is better. In fact, I think we find that life has us opportunities. If you think about the definition of both of those, the definition of sharing is to give a portion of something to others. A portion of something. The definition of giving 
is to freely transfer the possession of something to someone. Basically, you're handing it over. Now, there's advantages and disadvantages. There are blessings and there's selfishness in both of those, perhaps. But I'm not so sure that sharing doesn't require more of us than just giving. I can give you something and say, go to hell. I can give you something and say, I don't care about you. If I'm sharing where you are and a portion of it, do you see where you can, there, there are opportunities and challenges for us? I want us to wrestle with this in the context of bringing a healing that not only saves and delivers us, but helps us to walk into wholeness. Wholeness. My granny used to love it when people would spend time with her. My Aunt Mary and Uncle Jim lived over in Johnson City, Tennessee, about an hour away. And they'd come over, and they'd be rushed when they come, and they'd take Granny out to eat, and they'd be rushed during dinner, and they'd rush home, and then they'd rush back across the mountain before dark. Granny said, you know, it's nice that they want to go out to eat, but I really just want them to spend time with me. Sharing, not just giving. Sharing in life is about relationships, even relationships gone wrong. Oh my goodness, we've all been there. It's interesting in this gospel passage, as we quickly make this transition over to the gospel, that it's not if, but when. And here's what really struck me, struck out, struck in my mind. It's not your enemy that this passage is talking about. If your brother or your sister, one translation says, if somebody in the church right. sins against right. you. The psalmist wrote, it's not an enemy that's insulting me. I can handle that. It's not someone who hates me, who is exhausted over me. I can hide from that. No, it's you. My equal, my close companion, my good friend. It was so pleasant when we entered God's house with the crowd. My goodness, when relationships go wrong, not if, but when. And perhaps these two, the Exodus passage and the Matthew passage, are married together today perhaps for a reason. Because as the people of Israel came out of slavery... Sometimes they had to deal with disagreements in among themselves. And we're not going to have a life that's shared together when there's not a difference of opinion. But my friends, it's how we go about it. I mentioned this earlier when I read this passage earlier for us from Matthew's Gospel that you have seen it and so have I used in an abusive kind of way. You know, in, in a strict letter of the law, literal letter of the law, all right, I'm going to come talk to you. you know, I love that direct dealing part. Because lots of times we'll be hurt. And we'll be stewing about it. And we'll be stewing about it that it eats us alive, but yet we won't go talk to the person who hurt us. We'd rather get on the phone and talk to somebody else and try to triangulate somebody else in the middle of all that and create a holy mess. Direct dealing is important. But my friends, let's remember this passage is not a license to be combative. Confronting something doesn't mean you com you com you're being combative or should be combative. It's not a license to gang up on somebody. Right. I've had that happen to me. So oh, I'm going well, to follow what the scripture says. I brought some up. Well, they come over here to try to intimidate me. I know how that goes. Right. You've experienced that, Charlie. You're not. I know you know that, right? Yeah. yeah okay. Sir. You got a witness on that one? Mm -hmm. All right. Sir. All right. We'll, we'll save that one for later. Sir. <laughs> it's not a license as well to prove that you're the only one who's right. Right, right, right. How many of us want it? We don't care about reconciling with somebody. We just want people to know we're right. Been there. Amen. You know, we can still all do that is said and not accomplish what I believe is the intent of the scripture. And that's re reconciliation and unity. Because time and time again, What's mentioned in this passage is that you will win your brother and sister back. Right, right. It's not really a matter of whether who's right or who's wrong, but can you come together in unity and in relationship? It says where two or three are gathered, and it ends in a way, it talks about things that are bound in heaven and on earth, and it's confusing language, but that's a, a phrase that's nuanced, I think, in and you look at some of the Jewish writings in the early history, that that was a phrase to say that it gave authority to it. Right. It basically that if you agree on something, that it is either forbidden or permitted, both on earth and in heaven. You put it in that context, it makes a little more sense. Not just, oh, is it still waiting on me when I get to heaven? Amen. And then it says where two or three are gathered reminds us that life is to be shared in relationship. 
And yes, we come to this communion table every week individually. We've talked about this before, that it is our faith that has to be our own. All right. But it can't just stay with us. It's to be shared in community. I believe that's the beauty of how God has created us. In fact, communion, it's its root from community. And Eucharist means thanksgiving. This table of grace that we're invited to. But I'm reminded too of the Old Testament scripture, both the Old Testament and the New Testament scripture. Somewhere it says, if you along the way to bring your gifts, you remember that your brother has, or sister has something against you, leave your gift and go and be reconciled. Right. Don't wait for them to come to you. Right. You true. go to them. <laughs> Proverbs says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. A healing that leads to deliverance into wholeness. Do you and I want to be saved and delivered more than we want to walk into wholeness? Are we willing to do both? I think there's room, I know there's room in our lives in this world that God has created. That God, I've said this often, God didn't do things the way that God did them in terms of sending Jesus to be and walk this world with us because God had to, but because God chose to. Amen. Did what happened at Easter and with the crucifixion and the resurrection, did it change, one theologian said, did it change God's mind about us or does it change our mind about God? Wow. A healing that leads to both deliverance and wholeness. I hope you'll walk this journey with us over the next few weeks as we answer and ask the question is, what does it take for us to heal? Emotionally, physically, literally, spiritually, intellectually in our lives, when we've had so many hurts, when there continues to be a, so many injustices and, and loss of life, unnecessarily so in this world, but yet we are still called together around this table of grace and love and reconciliation. The Lord is with you. And also with you. The Lord is in you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right indeed, O Lord, to give you thanks and praise, and so we lift our voices with all the saints and angels and proclaim your glory and unending praise as we praise today's saying. Holy, 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 Lord God, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Was there in the highest, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, in the name of that and the Most gracious and merciful God, creator of us all, we praise you and thank you for the way that you have created each of us. Yes, Lord, thank you. And as we discover and live into that, we are so thankful that your grace has been poured out, that your mercy has been given, that we're already forgiven. It's just acknowledging, accepting, and living into it. Thank you that you create us in a way that we can't contain it, that we have to share it, and restore unto us the joy of our salvation today in a way that we reflect your love, that we share your love, that we live your love, and claim it for this day and all the days ahead. Pour out your spirit upon us and in and through these gifts today. May we receive from you, from the top of our head to the tip of our toes and all that's in between, all that you have for us to receive. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Jesus took the bread from the communion table, perhaps what was left, and he blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body as often as you receive it. You receive me. Literally translated, this is my body open to you. A God who created us, a God who loves us, a God who wants to live in relationship with us, open right. to the possibilities that God gives us. In the same way, he took the cup and poured the cup and blessed it and said, this is the new covenant for grace and mercy and forgiveness. It's already yours. Right. Just realize it, accept it, receive it. Because you may be called on to give it yourself sometimes too. Today we receive God's grace and mercy. Would you say it with me? It is for me. It is, it is for me. me. 
Say it louder like you mean it. It is for me. No matter who you are, where you are, know you are a child of God. And you can celebrate with us this day that God is a God that leads us in the moment, behind us, beside of us, and ahead of us for all of it. I want you to get on the phone and text somebody or and also tell them or Twitter with them or write in the comments on Facebook, God's love is for you too. Say it loud. God's love is for you too. God's, God's love, love is for you too. I encourage folks when we're all here together, real quickly, folks, to ease into that y'all and you ends and all that. <laughs> I encourage us that when we share God's love, to do it first individually. Not in that grand generic sense, even though it is in the grand generic sense. Because when we do it individually, it's authentic. It comes from my heart to your heart. From your heart to your heart. And yes, it is true. God's love is for all people. No one is turned away. Today we proclaim the great miracle and mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ has is risen, risen. And Christ, Christ shall come again. again. My brothers and sisters, children of God, all of you, go find something that you can share, orange crush, peanut butter crackers, a cookie, a cracker, a cup of juice, a cup of milk, whatever it is, I invite you to share. I'm going to invite our musicians to come back and share from this table. No one is turned away.
cup of God's grace and mercy and salvation. Now I invite you, wherever you are, sing it by yourself or across the room to somebody else or if you're outside listening on your heads, headset earpiece in the grocery store, sing it in the grocery store aisle. Let's sing together the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm.